Hey everyone, welcome to the next Earth Science Review video in the series. This is going to be video number 31, and we are going to be talking about the second part of the dy dynamic crust unit. So this is going to be focused solely on earthquakes. So um, the majority of this, there's a little content, but a lot of the questions that seem to be a little confusing are the ones that are dealing with the earthquake chart on page 11 of the reference table. So make sure you have that out, page 11. And uh, we'll do the content first, then we'll teach you the graph, and then we'll do some practice questions. All right, here we go. So we are talking about earthquakes today, and a couple of vocab words that you got to know about earthquakes. The first one is going to be the epicenter. So when the earthquake actually shakes, normally that happens on a fault, and in this case you could see the break in the rock right here. So the location that the earthquake actually happens is called the focus point. Now, directly above that on the surface of that focus point is called the epicenter. So this is pretty much the location that the ground shakes first. There's two waves that really come out of an earthquake. The first one's called a P wave, and that wave is shaped like a longitudinal wave, which is like a sound wave, so it's like a spring, like this. And then an S wave is a transverse wave that comes out second, S for second, and that one's transverse. Now, speaking of beach, if you have an earthquake underwater, it can cause a tsunami. It's very destructive, like flood, essentially. So a couple facts about the P wave. It's the first wave that comes out of the earthquake. It's longitudinal, like we said. And it can also travel through a solid, liquid, or gas. The P wave is always going to be the first wave to arrive at the epicenter because it's really fast. So if you're standing at the earthquake epicenter, you're going to feel the P wave first. The S wave is transverse, so it looks like a tidal wave, essentially, and it can only travel through a solid, which is why I put S for solid. S is also for second, and S is also for slow, because this wave doesn't hit till after the P wave. So we got a seismograph. A seismograph is a tool that we use to measure the magnitude of an earthquake, or the strength, essentially. And uh, they pretty much scribble lines on a piece of rolling paper, and that'll show you how powerful the earthquake is, and it can also tell you how far away it is. So generally, the rule of thumb is going to be the closer that the P wave is to the S wave on the seismogram, that's going to be... Uh, an area that's closer to where the earthquake happened. So like for example in this scenario here this P wave is pretty close to this S wave so the earthquake probably was really close to the location. A uh, second example would be like like if I drew another P wave and S wave so if this was the P wave and you had a lot of time and then the S wave hit right this one would be far away compared to this one which would be close because there's less distance between where the P wave and S wave are. Now in order to find out the exact epicenter of an earthquake you need three seismic stations. So wherever the three intersect, which is where my green arrow is, is where the epicenter is going to be. So you can't do it without three seismograph stations. The Richter scale is currently the scale we use to determine how strong the earthquake was, and it's measured in magnitude, which is pretty much the power of the earthquake. What can you do when an earthquake comes through? Uh, you can anchor things to try to prevent them from falling, but other than that, when the earthquake just comes through, you're going to take cover. We also actually studied earthquakes to figure out that one of the uh, layers of the earth is actually a liquid, which is the outer core. So what ends up happening is the P wave, so say there's an earthquake up here, the P wave goes straight through to the other side of the earth. But instead of it going in a straight line, a P wave actually bends because when it hits that other material through the earth, it refracts. So it doesn't just go straight through the earth like you would think. So that's the P wave. The S wave actually goes straight through, but it actually stops and disappears once it hits the liquid because remember an uh, S wave can only go through a solid. Now with this pattern happening all over the planet sometimes there's an area where you don't get any waves that's called the shadow zone so if the earthquake happened up here the P wave refracts 
the S wave gets absorbed. So on this spot on the Earth right over here, there was no wave that came through through the Earth. So that's called the shadow zone. All right, so this is going to be where I'm going to run through this chart. So essentially, you got two axes of information, the epicenter distance on the bottom. This is how far away the earthquake was, and it's times 10 to the third kilometers. So each of these is 1,000. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, so on and so forth. So each little line is 200. And then you got your travel time on the left, which is how long the wave was traveling for. And that's one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute. And the little lines are 20 seconds each. Now you got two waves. The P wave is first and the S wave is second. Now essentially you can uh, get asked a lot of questions on this chart in all different forms. So we're going to do example questions. But the a quick little synopsis is, for example, say um, you can be asked, oh, the P wave let's just say the P wave took, um, I don't know, let's just say four minutes to get to the location and they can ask how far away was the epicenter distance. So essentially you would just go to four minutes, go across till you hit the P wave line, which is about here. So it's almost 2000 kilometers away for the epicenter distance. You would just go straight down from that point. If they ask about the S wave, at four minutes, they can ask how far away it was. You would go to four minutes, but then you would stop at the S wave line and then go straight down. So that would be about a little less than a thousand away. So that's one thing they can do. They can also tell you the epicenter distance and ask you how long it would take. An example of that would be, let's say the epicenter distance is 2000 kilometers and they ask, how long the P wave would take to get there. You would just go to 2000 kilometers, go up to the P wave. So it would take a little over four minutes for it to get there. They can also ask you the S wave at 2000. You would just go to 2000 down here, go up until you hit the S wave. So that's about seven minutes and 20 seconds it would take. The only other major thing they can ask in terms of finding something would be how much time is it between the P wave and the S wave getting to the station? So to do that, you would have to take a piece of scrap paper, line it up between, so say, say for example, they asked, say, 3,000 kilometers away, what's the difference in arrival time between the P wave and the S wave? You would go to 3,000 right here, mark on your scrap paper here, mark on your scrap paper right there, and then drag that over here to figure out how much time is in between. Now remember, each of these grid boxes is 20 seconds, so you can do it by counting the grid boxes in between as well. So you can go 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 1 minute, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 2 minutes, 20, 40, 3 minutes, 20, 40, 4 minutes, 20 seconds, about 4 minutes and 30 seconds, roughly. So other than that, that's pretty much all they can ask you in terms of getting info from the gra uh, graph but we'll, we'll look at some of the questions and see what else they can do. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, get out your pen and paper and try to do these questions. Remember, pause, try to answer it, and then I'll go over what the answer is. So number one says, the magnitude of an earthquake is a number that represents the, all right, hopefully you got D, the magnitude is the strength or the amount of energy coming out of the earthquake measured on the Richter scale. Number two, which statement best explains why no S waves were received directly from this earthquake at some of the seismic stations on the graph? All right, we talked about this before, but the interior of the earth is has a liquid layer which absorbs the S wave. So that's why you wouldn't get the S wave to come through sometimes. Number three, which models represent each of the waves? All right, remember the P wave looks like a spring, that's longitudinal, and the S wave looks like a, uh, a tidal wave, which is transverse. So it should be uh, A, these are called compressional waves, and these are called shear waves. All 
All right, number four. So this is going to be a earthquake chart question on page 11. So seismic station A is 5,000 kilometers from the epicenter. What is the difference between arrival time of the first P wave and the first S wave? So they want us, if they ask you for difference of arrival time, you need to find the gap between the waves. So you could do this by counting the boxes at 5,000, or you can do this by counting, uh, doing your scrap paper. So I'm just going to demo it by doing it by counting to go over it. So what's the difference between the P and S wave at 5,000? So try it. All right, let's see what we could do here. So we're going to go to 5,000, so we're starting here and we're ending here. That would be the difference of time in between the two waves. So I'm just going to count 20, 40, 1, 20, 40, 2 minutes, 20, 40, 3 minutes, 20, 40, 4 minutes, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 5, 20, 40, 6, 20, 40, 6, 40. Hopefully that's a choice. Yep, nailed it. So if you like the counting method, you could do that. If not, just mark it on scrap paper and drag it over to the side. Both are the same. Number five, the first P wave of an earthquake took 11 minutes to travel to the seismic station from the epicenter. So the P wave took 11 minutes. What is the seismic station's distance to the epicenter of the earthquake and how long did it take for the S wave to get there? So we wanna find the distance and we want to find the S wave time. All right, try it. All right, well, I can tell you right now, you could sort of cheat on this question a little bit without even using the chart. We know for a fact that the P wave always comes in first, right? So if the P wave didn't come in for 11 minutes, the S wave cannot have came in before 11 minutes. So that gets rid of this one, this one, and this one automatically. So I already know the answer is D before I even do the question, but we'll do the question pretending we didn't know that. So we want to go to 11 minutes on the P wave. Okay, 11 minutes is here, and we're going to go across until we hit the P wave, which is right here. So if I go straight down, my epicenter distance is going to be right here. So it goes 7,600 for the distance. And then my S wave time, you would just go straight up at that dot to the S wave line, which is right here. And you go across, and there it is, 20 minutes. So you could do it either way. You could do my cheat if you knew that S wave always comes after P wave, or you can just use the chart. Number six, a strong earthquake underwater could result in which of those? All right, hopefully you picked A, a tsunami. All right, number seven, we're doing another chart question. The epicenter of the earthquake was located at 1,800 kilometers from the station. If the S wave arrived at 10.06 and 40 seconds, what time did the P wave arrive? Okay. So we have our first time on a clock here. Now, the first thing we want to do is how much time is in between the P wave and the S wave. So we got to get that. If we can get that, we can get the answer. So try it and then see how you do. All right, so let's go to 1,800 kilometers. And we're going to figure out the difference between the P wave and the S wave. So 1,800 is here. Here's my P wave and here's my S wave. So we're going to count. 20, 40, 1 minutes, 20, 40, 2 minutes, 20, 40, 3 minutes time difference. Okay. So there's 3 minutes. And remember, the P wave always comes first. So if the S wave hit at 10.06.40, the P wave has to hit 3 minutes before that. So all we're going to do is take away 3 minutes. So this would be 10.03 and 40 seconds. B. So for this question, you had to know the difference, and then you had to know that the P wave came before it. And then you just subtract the clock time. If you did not understand that question, I would rewind the video right now and re 
listen to me explain how to do this. All right, number eight. An earthquake occurs at 10.05. At 10.09, the first P wave from the earthquake is detected. Approximately how many kilometers away is the seismic station? I'm not going to explain anything to you on this one. I want to just see if you can do it. So pause, see if you can do it, really try, and then unpause and let me go over it. So hopefully you tried. An earthquake occurs at 10.05 and it's 10.09 you feel the P wave. So that means the P wave took four minutes. That was your big thing to get. So if I know the P wave took four minutes, I could go to four minutes to the P wave, which is this wave right here. It's about here, which means the epicenter distance was a little bit before 2,000 kilometers away. So we're looking for, yeah, B because it says approximately, so you would just pick the closest one, even though we knew it's like 1,900, pretty much. All right, two more. Number nine, the first P wave travels 5,600 from the epicenter and arrives at the station at 10.05. What time did the actual earthquake happen? Pause, try it. All right, so we got 5,600 kilometers away, and the P wave arrived at 10.05. So we have to figure out how long did the P wave take to get there. So we're going to go to 5,600 kilometers. So 5,200, 400, 600, we're going to go up to the P wave. So it's right here. So the P wave took nine minutes to get there. Now, since we know that, we could figure out when the earthquake happened. It happened nine minutes before whatever time it was. So you would do 10.05 minus nine minutes. So that would be 9.56. Because if the earthquake happened at 9.56, the P wave then had to travel nine minutes to get to the spot to get the ground to start shaking because the earthquake happened 5,600 kilometers away. All right, and last but not least, which map location is closest to the epicenter of this earthquake? All right, hopefully you remembered that it's going to be the intersection point between all three circles, which is right here, which looks like H3. C. All right, well, as always, thanks for joining me. The earthquake chart can be a little bit confusing i'm aware of that so if you need to that's the beauty of youtube rewind it go back to where i explain the chart and then re-go back try the questions again watch my explanations again i did every type of question that you can get so if you understand the questions that i did in this you will be able to do any of them all right good luck on your tests and for the rest of the school year and uh yeah i'll talk to you soon bye